Welcome to part two of my double bass from Garbage Built. Uh, this video is sponsored by Arbor Tech. If you didn't see the first video, I would strongly recommend watching that first. This will all make more sense. And uh, all right, just strap in. It wouldn't be a base made from garbage if I didn't use any pallet wood. So I had this ash that I had scored from these giant pallets at a steel yard near me that I decided to plane down and glue together to form the block that I would carve my neck from. All right, check this out. This is a neck off of my 1956K base that has broken several times over the decades and has been repaired several times over the decades. And the last time it broke, I replaced it with a new neck that I bought at GoldierMusic.com. It's an Engelhart neck, which is they took over the patents, so they're compatible. Um, they always break, I shouldn't say always, but they very frequently break in here in the heel. And uh, what I'm going to try on the blank that I'm gluing up now that I'm going to carve is I'm stacking the, the pallet wood ash that I'm using, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill through and put a piece of wood going the opposite direction um, in a contrasting color to give it this sort of two directions of grain, which I hope will make it stronger. And it'll also look really cool when I start carving it out. I think we'll see a little bit of that hidden grain in there. Besides that broken neck, I also brought my 1930s aluminum base into the shop, so I had something to reference for some basic measurements and angles. The neck wants to go into the body. It doesn't go in like straight at a 90. It goes at about a 76 degree angle, so it's tilting up a little bit to give the strings to go up over the bridge and we get that angle and that down pressure going on. Uh, I want to put in the block on the body of the guitar, a dovetail, and I want to have at the bottom of the neck another dovetail so I can slide them together. Traditionally, they would be glued together like this, um, but I want to run a bolt through mine so I can remove the neck if I ever want to take it apart to travel. You can see here I have both, most of the math basically figured out. Um, this is a neck that was cut off before. There needs to be a block of wood here that goes out over the body. Here's that angle I was talking about, and here's where I want that dovetail. So I could cut it on the table saw like I did here, but it gets tricky because I have to have a stop here, and it's going to be at an angle. So I'm not sure if that's going to be something that I'm going to be comfortable doing, all those compound angles. So instead what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to cut a block like this, get my nice dovetail on it, and then glue it into my assembly here. That will give me a piece of wood with an alternating grain, which will add to my structure and stability. And then I'll just have some very basic math to work that in, I think. If you don't know what this tool is that I keep using, it's called the Square, S-Q-W-A-Y-R-E, and uh, it's a tool that I invented and sell at timsoynet slash square. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not smart enough to do this sort of thing. <laughs> but I figured it out. It took me a while. Um, I've used dovetail router bits before, and I've done hand-cut dovetails. But there was nothing like a, this. It seemed the best way to do this large format sliding dovetail was on the table saw. And it took a few practices, but I, I figured it out. It was easy to make both shapes, the male and the female. The tricky part was getting them to fit together correctly. In my previous attempts, I kept making the fit too loose, um, so this time I just aired on the other side and made it a little too tight, and then I kind of cleaned it up by hand. It turns out that that dowel that I put in earlier got mostly cut away. I didn't go in far enough, um, but I liked this solution that I came up with of uh, cleaning this all out and putting that alternating grain block. It made assembling the dovetail so much easier, and I feel like that's actually going to really help the structure of that fragile part of the instrument. It was really not hard to cut all of this to fit properly because you had to leave clearance for the base when it's going to fit in and, and all that stuff, but it, it wasn't hard at all. Now it was time to carve out and shape the neck. So first that required cutting off most of the excess on the bandsaw, and I, 
I was very obsessive about my measuring in this process and really taking it slow and doing little bits at a time because there's a lot of compound angles and cutting were involved to shape this out. Uh, always trying to think ahead about how I could have a flat surface to get as much of it cut on the bandsaw as possible. The tailstock was too tall for my bandsaw, so I wasn't able to cut that out there. I instead cut as much as I possibly could, and then I finished it off by hand and with uh, hand planes and sanders, the stuff that I couldn't cut cleanly. Now here comes the fun part. I used the Arbortech turbo plane to rough in the contours and shape of my neck. This tool is very aggressive and it's designed to be used with the guard on the angle grinder, which you can see I am not using. Make sure to use your own discretion, know your tools, and know your comfort level before doing anything dangerous with dangerous tools. I also use the Arbortech Mini Carver to get into some of the tighter areas, and then I will use that in a little bit to carve out my headstock design. I had a big old chunk of wood blow out of the heel, so I tinted a little epoxy so I would never forget where it was. Now with the neck shaped out, it was time to do the headstock. I cut the angle in that goes there, and there's like a pocket that all of the tuners go into. It does not go all the way through, so I hogged out most of the material using Forstner bits so you can see it tapers in as it goes. And then I saved my cutoff scrap so I could clamp it safely into my vise and clean up the rest of it with a chisel. The tuners are a tapered shape to them that the string wraps around, so I needed two different drill bits to drill the first hole that it goes through, then the second hole that holds the end. Now it was time to carve the headstock shape. You can see I screwed that clamp down to my workbench and that held it still. And Then I learned how to use the mini carver. Um, I probably should have done a little more practicing on scrap, but I didn't do much. I jumped right in and I just kind of figured out how to hold it, the best angle to go. There's some tight spots that I had to use some traditional carving tools like chisels, but um, it all worked out pretty well. I was designing on the fly as I did this. I hadn't decided if I wanted to do a traditional headstock or something more unique. And then once I started getting into it, I got this idea to do basically a traditional headstock, but just a little bit of an edge instead of getting really carried away. So instead of the traditional scroll that you would see up there, I made these arrows that I then glued on and uh, carved into the shape of the headstock. So that's why I'm maybe going a little out of order because I was just making it up as I went. Now near the end, uh, I started really getting much more comfortable with the mini carver and I fell in love with it. I can't wait to experiment with it some more. I also used the Arbortech contour sander to help me sand some of these tight areas. I drilled a couple holes through the heel and the neck block so I could put those anchors in and bolt it down. It seems alright. Of course it works. If you want to hear this thing for real, go check out my other channel, youtube.com slash newperspectivesmusic. On that channel, you can hear this played in front of a good microphone, and I kind of A-B it against some of my other bases in my collection, like this aluminum one, a 1956K plywood base, and a 1920s carved check base, so we can see if garbage can really hang with the pros. On to the top. Like I mentioned in part one, this base is what would be considered a hybrid base. It is a back and sides made of plywood and I wanted to make a real wood carved top. These are some real nice white cedar fence boards that I pulled out of that pile of reclaimed fence boards. <laughs> and uh, they are actually a wall in my shop for a few years too, but um, I decided to use those and I planed them down. But they're not thick enough to carve a whole top, right? They're only about three quarters of an inch thick. So I jointed them all up and I made a couple surfaces that I've then glued together to double the thickness to about an inch and a half. It's still not quite as thick as I would have liked, but I figured I would start there for my first base.
This is a little trick I learned many years ago for gluing together panels like that. You'll notice that piece of wood bows out in the center. I had planed the edges down shorter. So now if I apply clamps to either side, the pressure actually gets pushed in the center more than the edges, and that helps to get to places where you might not have clamps that are long enough to get to them. A lot of glue, a lot of clamps around the edge, and then I also use those center clamps to push it down there. And uh, it came out all right. I saw some, when I started carving later, there are some gaps, but for the most part, it came out pretty good. So now I'm roughing out the shape of the base and I'm way oversizing it and uh, sort of figuring out where I'm gonna put everything to make sure it's gonna be able to get glued to the back and sides and fit. So I made a simple template for my F holes and just routed those out. Now you might think it's weird that I'm routing them out first, but there's a couple reasons. One is, is while it's flat, I can get a nice route going. I won't be trying to carve around a corner, even though it would be thinner and I could maybe use a coping saw. But the other reason is so I can see through the side because I don't ever want to go too far uh, while I'm carving. So here's what I did. Besides those holes in the center, on the top, I routed down a lip all the way around the edge, just roughly, of that's my maximum depth to carve the sides on the top where I carve it up. And then on the inside, I drilled holes in the middle for my maximum depth to drill in. So if I plane away the wood to the depth of that hole, I know that my top is about a quarter inch thick. And conversely, on the front side, I know if I plane my upward slope to just that edge lip that I created, I know that I won't get too thin on those edges either. So now it was time to bust out that turbo planer and make a mess. The turbo plane throws such big chips so quickly, they actually kind of sting a little bit when they hit your hands. That's why I have that thin glove on. If I were using the guard as designed, that wouldn't be an issue. Again, know your own comfort level. And uh, another way of looking at this carving, in case that was confusing, is I'm basically making a giant bowl. So on the inside of the base, I'm carving a dished shape bowl out. But then on the outside of the base, I want it to be rounded to match. So I'm doing the exact opposite and carving an arch. That's why there are all these guides here, because I can't see through. And uh, having those F holes cut out first really helped a lot. Although I guess they're arrow holes, not F holes. I thought about taking this outside so I wouldn't make such a mess out of my shop. But then I thought, you know what? I'm not a caveman. That's why I have a shop. So I don't have to work outside. <laughs> I wanted to do the front last so I would have a flat surface while I was doing the inside and again I'm still just roughing but here you can see I'm roughing down to that guide line that I had roughly routed into the edge and uh, I know not to go any deeper than that and so I just work my shape in but while I'm using the turbo plane again this thing removes a lot of wood quickly so you really want to take small bites and stop and look and think a lot. This is surprisingly already becoming musical. This video is sponsored by ArborTech. I, I love ArborTech stuff. It's power carving for the 21st century. Now, in you know the Stradivarius days or whatever, when you would make this instrument, you would sculpt it out and you would hollow this dish out with, with hand tools. That's the 21st century. We're using power tools to do that. So I was able to hog out and carve this entire top in really just a couple hours, which is unprecedented. Um, and the mini carver that they make is what I use to do the headstock and some of the more detailed stuff. And this is a really, really cool tool. Um, at first when I started to use it, I, I didn't quite get it, how to hold it. So you need to practice a little bit and figure it out. But then once I figured out like how to hold it and how, to, how far to push and how hard and everything, it, it made sense and I was able to, I got better and better as I went. And this is the first time I've ever used anything like this. So uh, I'm looking forward to doing more stuff with this. I can see this being a very useful way to continue to, to carve and uh, I want to do some more artsy stuff with it too. Arbitex stuff is super useful for any kind of power carving and it's not just carving eagles and bears out of logs as you can see it's something that uh, you know in fine instrument building is almost necessary in your toolkit. So. Now that the Arbitex tools got me into the ballpark of my shape I put a just coarse grit sandpaper onto my angle grinder and started to smooth it out and sand the shape in the rest of the way. See here, I actually started angling in a little bit too far, so it's not quite flush. Though. That means I'm gonna have to go around here and here and bring that level down a little bit so I can get a nice purchase there. 
I got this little hand plane from my Reclaimed Audio podcast partner, Phil Pinsky's store called ironandsoul.com. That's S-O-L-E. And uh, it's a great little tool. This one I got at a flea market for five bucks and tuned up myself. I want the top to overhang the body a little bit by just about a quarter inch. Um, so I'm drawing my line to where I'm going to cut this top instead of using a flush trim router. But instead of putting the pencil up flat against the body, I'm going to use a carpenter pencil and I'm going to turn it sideways like this. And then that will give me a line that's about a, consistently a quarter inch outside of the body. and get a little better idea of what I'm working with material-wise. So I can see um, I've got plenty of material here still. Too much I have to bring down in shape, but then I can see over on this side, I'm right about where I want to be, about a quarter inch. And I can see all around all the inconsistencies, because I was just power carving, and now I go in and finesse it. And right here, this is like, this is where we stop, right there. I think it looks kind of cool how there's those two layers of wood and the grain changes through the carve, but that edge is like really cruddy. <laughs> and uh, so there's some cool and uncool things about this system. The only support that goes into this top is this base bar that runs along the low E string side of the top and it gets carved in. Sometimes they actually just carve it right into the shape of the top. So it's all one piece of wood, but uh, I thought that was too much for me to try to take on and I glued one on instead with a little bit of creative clamping. And then the other thing that holds the top up under the pressure of the strings is the sound post and you'll see more of that and we'll talk about it in part three. There were, of course, a few cracks uh, here and there and some spots that needed to be fixed. I used some uh, Starbond CA glue, and then that's that edge uh, where the two types of wood meet together. I went around the whole edge with CA glue and just sort of sturdied it all up a little bit to hopefully prevent some splitting. That seems like a good place to wrap up the second part of this video series. As you can see, I have all the basic shapes and parts made and cut. Um, and I'm just about ready to actually assemble it and make it play and finish and all that stuff too, which is a whole other set of skills. So I'm going to tackle those in part three. Make sure you tune into that video. Thank you very much, Arbortech, for sponsoring this video. Like, Arbortech stuff is awesome. Um, I'm a huge fan. I highly recommend you check it out if you do any kind of power carving. If you want to make wood disappear quickly, <laughs> this is where you start. The finishing too, they have the sanding and stuff too. But basically, that's what I look at to Arbortech is like, I want to make this shape happen quick, and then I'm going to deal with the rest later. These are the guys. Thank you very much. See you in the next video.